the world would be a better place if people knew their purpose and had the opportunity to go after it. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here. We have Farah Nanji, who's the founder and CEO of Regents Racing. It's an events company dedicated to applying the Formula One car racing sensibility to the business world. And she has a unique and inspiring story, which as you know, I, uh, I geek out at these great stories of, uh, of successful people and sort of how they got there and their journey. Uh, and I'm so excited for her to share the story. At, at 15, she was diagnosed with dyspraxia, a learning disability where a person's brain sends a delayed signal to the rest of their body, making motor skills and sequencing become difficult. But that didn't stop her. And uh, this was the diagnosis that encouraged Farah to pivot into doing lots of amazing things, which we'll get into. Uh, but that's, but in addition to that, uh, Farah has entered the world of house music. She's also a uh, well-known DJ, too, and she's been touring, and uh, she runs, as I mentioned, an incredible company called Regents Racing. So we're so excited to have you here today, Farah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Cara. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. So take us back to the beginning. We in that intro, we learned a little bit about you, but take us back to the beginning about how, you know, when you were a kid and, and kind of your journey around learning overall. Yeah, definitely. So my passions are, are definitely a little bit different. Um, and I'm lucky to have sort of made a, you know, a business in, in out of my passions, but really they stem from my childhood. Um, because Growing up, I was basically quite a tomboy. You know, I really liked football. I liked um, racing. I liked cricket. Um, and I was kind of bullied because I went to this extremely high pressurized uh, school. It was an all girls school and it was the top 10 in the United Kingdom. So, you know, people were preparing for Oxford and Cambridge. Um, you know, getting an A wasn't good enough. It had to be an A star. Um, and I just wasn't very understood, I guess, in my surroundings. And for me, you know, we're talking about a time when the internet was just coming out. Um, and I discovered house music basically, and it, and it totally changed my life. Um, but just before I discovered house music, probably the seven years prior to that, I'd been learning the Spanish guitar and it was sort of the first kind of, um, exposure that I had that, you know, music is really a healing tool. Um, and, you know, playing an instrument, learning an instrument, but also just being inspired by the sounds that come out, um, you know, are, are ex extremely powerful. And many years later today, the sound that I play is, is, is quite Spanish. It's, it's Balearic. It has a lot of those gyp gypsy scales, um, but with the house music electronic vibe, um, and actually I perform quite a lot now with um, a live guitarist. Um, so it's definitely shaped sort of my musical identity. Um, and then the motorsports thing came about, you know, again, from that sort of just sort of like escaping kind of the surroundings. And uh, one day I went to a kid's birthday party and it was a go-karting event. And for anyone who's ever been in a go-kart before, I'm sure they'll probably identify if they liked it, um, that it's a bit of a uh, mind body, out of mind body experience. You know, um, you're feeling the engine so close to you. It's literally like, you know, underneath you, um, you're, you know, you're in, you're, there's no kind of closed cockpit. You're, you're just so close to the ground and, um, and, you know, you've got a helmet on and nobody knows if you're a boy or a girl, it's really about your performance and developing this rhythm with a, with a track and understanding how to, uh, push yourself to, perform at the limit. And, um, you know, for many years I was, uh, I was karting and I was actually doing quite well getting on podiums. Um, but then, yeah, I got this diagnosis in my teenage years and, um, it sort of, you know, it, obviously it, it sort of meant to me that like, you know, the goal that I had, which was like definitely formula one was not going to happen with this diagnosis. But I was also perplexed because, in some ways, you know, a lot of people who have dyspraxia, like they, they technically shouldn't be, um, you know, good at driving, um, you know, and, and there was definitely barriers I was reaching with advancing my progress, but I, you know, only then I realized why. 
However, um, you know, the, the, the barriers to motorsport, apart, apart from that for me, were, you know, the fact that today, here we are, 2021, we still don't have a female Formula One driver on the grid. So, and that, that is still a couple of generations away. So there's that. Um, and then there's also the financial aspect of entering this sport. It's not an accessible sport. It's not like picking up a football and going to the park and, you know, uh, kicking a ball. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a six figure investment from families. Um, and it's, 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 you know, it's a lot of, a lot of money and, you know, at a young age again to, to do that without sponsors and all of that is, is very, is a huge barrier. So many drivers face. Um, but what it did lead for me was, um, you know, like really understanding performance and high performance and, and yeah, many late, many years later, it led to me actually innovating in the sport, disrupting and, really championing the sport and making, making the lesson, um, getting the lessons from it and, and applying it to everyone's life. Because whether you care about driving or not, there's a lot you can take away from that sport. Um, as with many sports, but obviously major sports is the one that I'm most passionate about. That's awesome. So when you first got this diagnosis, when you were 15, what were some of your biggest challenges? Like how did they know to actually test for this? It's actually um, a learning difficulty that 5% of the population have, they think. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not, a f you know, it's quite a few people, you know, in the world. And the, the common signs are, you know, you, you struggle with things like maths because it's heavily about sequences, coordination. Um, so maths was a really difficult subject for me. Um, and that kind of leads on a little bit into like um, science, so physics and chemistry. I, you know, I struggled with that. And there was this huge disparity be between my expressive subjects like English, RS, history and maths. And and to be in this school, you know, um, through all subjects, you know, minimum, you should be getting a B. And, and I was, you know, doing way less than that in maths and science. So they kind of couldn't, um, they, at the beginning, they thought I was just sort of, you know, being a troublemaker or just being a rebel and not wanting to do this. Because I did have a bit of a rebellious personality, but they just like you know that but they yeah so i guess anyway then one day they were just sort of like you know maybe you should think about going to a psych educational psychologist because maybe you can get extra time um to help you with the exams because the exams were like looming um and so i personally felt it was more out of pity than oh we think that something's wrong because they never my teachers never said oh we actually think that you have um a learning block um they they always thought it was a behavioral issue um and it, and it never was um, and so when I went to the uh, educational psychologist, it was just a, you know, one day test, uh, you know, not more than that. And they test for really simple things like, um, drawing a straight line, children who have dyspraxia, you know, typically can't draw straight lines, which explained why, you know, again, subjects like DT, which are design technology, which is a lot about cutting things, can't cut in a straight line. And I was always like, what, why is it always becoming so jagged? And then obviously then I understood, um, but yeah, and then also your handwriting becomes quite illegible after like 10, 20 minutes of writing. So they allow you to then use a computer during your your studies as well um, to sort of just overcome that. Um, so th those were some of the things. But, you know, these signs, they they can they appear very early on in childhood. So because um, I was diagnosed, you know, relatively late, you, you, you know, if you if you're younger um, and you're diagnosed, I mean, the, the telltale signs are there like you know, um, struggling with sports, uh, balance, coordination, um, perhaps sometimes your speech isn't, it takes a bit longer to for, get your speech formation. Um, and so, uh, you know, these signs really, they, they appear from like literally three or four years of age, um, quite early on. So. And what about like sequencing, like time or money or ability, like you talked about, you know, with Formula One racing that a lot of people with this might not be able to drive or mm. what other things like that came to light? Telling the time definitely took a few, a few, a bit longer, but that that's fine now. <laughs> um, and I think it's really about the coordination angle aspect that that's really where um, a person, but more than anything. Yeah. It's because it's just, it, there's that delayed sequence. So, you know, and then by, by that point, you know, your spatial awareness is heavily affected by not being able to, to understand your dimensions and things like that. So um, I think those are the primary areas where, but, you know, all of this also has a, you know, um, a sort of secondary effect, which is, 
you know, when such stuff like that's going on, it's, it's overwhelming, especially when you're in your teenage years and you're, you know, you're learning how to regulate your emotions, you know, your, you know, all of those things you're going through, um, you're sh shaping your identity and, and obviously your surroundings play a huge uh, role in that. So if you're not in a nurturing, supportive environment, um, you know, whether it's your family or your educators, uh, totally. obviously it's going to, it's going to be more, you know, you're going to get insomnia and all those things. Luckily I, I have amazing parents and they were always very supportive. But, um, you know, it's your educators who have to, to ha who have that responsibility to educate you in the end. So, um, if you don't have that, it, it's going to be a lot, you know, it's going to be a lot harder. Yeah. Well, and you touched on supportive family and, uh, and academics. I mean, how many people maybe just, particularly girls, I think with learning disabilities, where if you, you know, you just, are sort of written off as dingy or stupid or not able to get something right versus actually having um, a learning disability, which I've I've learned um, with uh, a couple of my own kids um, that have you know it it's not a matter it's just that they think differently and uh, and I think we just have to pay more attention to kind of how to teach people and and then also careers um, that go around you know what what those instead of thinking about them as disabilities think about them as assets so talk to me a little bit about that I mean you had your passions obviously but how did you think about transitioning you know what you wanted to do to do into what you do today? Yeah, I guess like when I got diagnosed, I, I didn't, it, it didn't really um, sort of sink in much because it, there wasn't any support. It was just like, this is what it is. You get some extra time and you get to use a laptop. And there, and there wasn't anything more than that. Like, this is how it's going to affect you day to day. This is what you need to be aware of. This is what you should be mindful of. Those you know, that, that journey wasn't there. So I, I had to figure out a lot of it for myself. So in a way, and that, and, you know, obviously there's strengths and weaknesses to that, but the, 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 you know, the good thing was, was that I was like, well, it's not going to stop me from what I do because like, I, you know, I love racing and I'm not going to stop this, but maybe it just means the goalpost has to be shifted a little bit. Um, and also, you know, sometimes you can be passionate about an industry and, and there's, you know, many ways to operate within an industry. Um, it may not be the, the full on driving seat. It may be something different. And actually now doing what I do, I actually, I'm like, oh, I think I really enjoy this more. Like, you know, coming up with really interesting events, um, around motorsport and exploring that theme of leadership through the sport. To me, that's like, that's so much more exciting than day to day, like getting in a car and, 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 and driving on a track. Although I, of course I love driving on a track, but to me, the fulfillment comes more from like empowering other people through the sport rather than just it being about me and driving and getting a result. Um, so yeah. And music wise, again, I mean, you know, back in the day, it wasn't, it was quite ambiguous, you know, how do you become a DJ? It wasn't, it wasn't something that, you know, the resources, you know, not like how they are today. Um, so it, it was very much, um, you know, growing up in London, you know, being part of an amazing music scene, being able to go out from a young age and explore that scene and, um, and sort of see also an environment where genuine, generally the dance floor is a very non judgmental place. It's about expression. It's about freedom. It's about release. And you see how that affects, um, people and my friends became, were the DJs really. Um, and I was lucky enough to sort of observe their environment for a couple of years, you know, quite, quite heavily on and, but then it was like, well, it, this isn't enough for me. I, I want to, you know, sort of share the sounds that I collect um, and uh, and see where that takes me. And um, what I will say is that I started both professionally before I went to university. And I think that that really gave me an edge because I was able to pursue them during university as well without being judged so much by like the professional world because you're still young you're still in university um you can make those mistakes um but then when I graduated I'd already done so much that it was quite an easy transition out of university to like forge a career path within it because I'd already been doing it in a way absolutely love that so your so Regents Racing is an events company how did you I mean, how did you even get started? It's great to say, oh, okay, I want to go and build this company around this idea. But what was, what was kind of the first step in really doing mm. that? Yeah. So it goes back to university. I was, I was very lucky to study at an amazing business school in London. Um, and we 
happen to have um, a very interesting demographic of students, 90% of whom are international. So they didn't know the UK very well. Um, and obviously the UK is uh, the home of, you know, motorsports. So you have more than 50% of Formula One teams based here. You have manufacturers and you have, um, you know, so many racetracks in all, all over the country. So as a, as a playground, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and in it, what I sort of um, noticed was like, you know, there's a lot of people here who who actually collect cars, who some of whom actually race professionally for for Dakar, for Red Bull, for Blank Pond, you know, extremely talented drivers. Um, but there isn't that society doesn't exist of motorsports. So, you know, why don't I, you know, set that up? And that's why the name is Regents Racing, because um, the university I went to is called Regents University. Um, and. It, it was a sort of an amazing thing because, I mean, I didn't expect it, but it, within a few years, it exploded on campus. We had 800 students, which the university only has about 3000 students. So we had almost a third of students that um, experienced an event of ours in some shape or form. Um, and because what you touched upon earlier about how learning uh, people with learning difficulties, they do think slightly differently. Um, and, so, and, 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 you know, one of the ways that I, I think I think really differently is I, I'm really driven by my, by senses um, and by sensorial experiences. And, and that became the core essence of regions racing. Like, how do you take, I mean, there's so many senses that go on in a driving experience, but how do you, how do you take all of those and how do you, how do you sort of amplify that and, 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 you know, yeah, really change things. So some of our events could actually be taking away a sense like um, we've done, an, we've done many events with Land Rover where, um, our, our members are actually blindfolded and they have to uh, place their trust in their co-pilot who's sort of saying, you know, go left by 10 degrees or, you know, um, and uh, and obviously that's really interesting. You know, it's it's um, sounds scary, but, you know, you're not going that fast or anything. Um, and yeah. And so so it, during those university years, it was it was like this sort of playground for me because I was able to like think of an event. Um, make it happen because I had a target audience or my audience was there um, and and uh, and and then it just evolved and it started getting its own identity as a brand because you know studying business as well so um, you know I started you know kind of creating a logo creating a website you know doing all the things that you know um, as a business you, you you do and also at the same in the same vein um, motorsports is an extremely dangerous and risky sport therefore it has to be run as a business it has to be run with health and safety measures in place um you know you you have to do it you know the right the right way um and it just evolved from that and and having having that sort of base um and today what the company does is essentially it kind of connects the students and alumni from that university but also you know um entrepreneurs leaders artists athletes um you know people who are already um, successful in their fields and kind of connects them to the future leaders of tomorrow. Um, and we do these events that really, you know, sort of push you in, um, out of your comfort zone and really try and get that peak performance, um, towards yourself. And we're sort of expanding into the corporate world now where we're doing the same thing, but for corporates, um, you know, for a, a team of 10, you know, from the same company, um, who want to take some of those learnings from formula one and really give their, their teams and companies a competitive edge. I love it. That's so great. How did your business shift during COVID? It has been very tough. Uh, we pretty much had to close for, you know, pretty much um, two years because it's not the type of experience you can do on Zoom. It's really like, you know, it's the beauty is being on site, is experiencing those things. So like, of course, we kept in touch with our community and stuff, but, you know, we weren't able to operate. So, I mean, the thing that shifted a little bit for us was like, I started this podcast, as you know, you're a guest on my show. Um, and we talked to sort of leaders from motorsport business and music. So we, we had more of a digital identity during that time. Um, but as a actual company, like we, you know, we had to let go of people and all the brutal things that came with the pandemic, but we've just started coming back to life. So, um, and there's more of a, but, and there's more excitement now because people are obviously like just so di like desperate to do events, you know? Yeah. And they want to get together. Absolutely. So have you started back doing a lot of DJing? I mean, I feel like people are getting out and wanting to um, be with people. Have you felt like that's picked up? Definitely. I mean, it's, it's the, it's the kind of thing where I like, I'm a bit, a bit cautious about it. I mean, I personally wouldn't want to be DJing in a room full of like 
10,000 people, um, I, I wouldn't feel safe to do that. So, but in the summer, like, yeah, we had, you know, some really nice outdoor events, which were, were fantastic. And, um, and, you know, I was able to like sort of play a lot, but I, I, for my music career, what, what this time has really given me, um, which I'm very grateful for is like just the time to be a lot more in the production process. Um, because typically before my life was like, you know, every two weeks I was like on the road traveling and you book in time in the studio and it's, it's not forced creativity, but you know, you just like, that's the day you have and that's, that's it. Like there's, you know, you, you either make something good or, or you don't. And, and then you're away for like, you know, however long and you're dealing with time zone adjustments and all that stuff. Whereas this time has just been a total creative freedom. Like, you know, I, I, I sort of built a makesh makeshift studio in my house and I just, it just became, you know, really just free flow, which was really, really nice. Um, so I've gone a bit deeper into that side of my artistic expression and slowly I'm sure the events will come back, but definitely the ones I played in the summer were amazing. And, you know, again, I mean, all, all of the events I played in the summer, um, most of them were 13 hour long <laughs> sets because people really didn't want to stop. Wow. Um, that's amazing. You know, so that was, that was quite fun. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. You know what I think is so interesting hearing your story, whether it's the Regents racing or everything that you're doing as a DJ too, you really feed off of the energy of others, right? And, uh, and moving people in some, in some way, right? You can probably feel when the crowd really understands your, creativity and and how do you think people i i so often want to push people into the space of uh figuring that out right and uh you're you have figured that out i think and i don't know if you define it that way but i call it as my book uh that came out undaunted i mean i call it living undaunted and really figuring out what you are meant to be doing and what your purpose is. And I think what you've proven too, is that when you figure out that thing, like, you know, we call it in the social media world engagement, right? You figured out engagement in the physical world where people are responding and to what you're bringing them. And I think that's a really powerful thing. It's a powerful thing for people to figure out personally as a leader, how people are responding to things too. I don't think there's you know, the five things that you need to do as a leader, I think it's people kind of have to figure out their own shtick, right? And, um, and how people are responding. And I really think like, that's what's so interesting and, and sincere, frankly, about your, what you're doing is that you really are bringing people into a space of figuring out what they do respond to. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the world would be a better place if, if people, you know, A, you know, knew their purpose and B, had the opportunity to go after it because it's one thing knowing what you're driven by, but of course the other op option is like having the opportunity to do it. And there are so many people I think that have reevaluated in the pandemic, you know, am I serving the right company? You know, what, what, what is the long lasting impact that I want to sort of contribute to this world and make it a better place because obviously we're in such a fragile and chaotic world I think more and more of us are like you know wondering sort of what's the what's the value we can bring to this you know how do how do we how do we yeah, affect that, everyone around us in that absolutely and you mentioned this I was on your podcast mm -hmm. recently but you started a podcast uh called mission makers do you want to tell everybody what that's all about yeah, definitely. So um, it's really, you know, although music and motorsport are, are two very different industries, um, obviously peak performance is definitely a, a key theme. And so I thought it'd be really interesting to start a show that sort of uncovers that mindset of of, of peak performance, but also uncovers misconceptions um, and also talks to business leaders, you know, as well. So we sort of feature, um, we have 11 episodes a season and we, we pretty much feature like three, um, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, three, three sort of um, guests from each each topic. And, um, and, and yeah, it's been doing, it's been an amazing journey as I'm sure you'll probably agree as a podcaster, it's been quite an, an interesting time with the pandemic because, because that market's like exploded and everyone's listening to podcasts now. And actually it's such a great way to like connect and, um, you know, just sort of have a, a digital voice and connect with your audience in a deeper way and, and really transmit a message. Um, and, and, you know, without it being about, you know, Instagram, which is image, you know, which is image, um, obsessed versus really the, the, the video or the, or the sort of, um, 
the, the the audio recording. So yeah, I really I'm really enjoying the podcasting journey and um let's see. It's 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 definitely a lot of as I'm sure you'll you'll definitely resonate, it's a lot of work to have, you know, all that content all the time. Yes. Um <laughs> But Definitely. you can get quite creative with, um, you know, season breaks and stuff. What to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's terrific. And I think there's so many learnings and inspiration and uh, everything that you do. And I really appreciate you sharing with the audience, especially people who are trying to figure out what can I do. And so often I hear people say that they've got limits, whether it's, um, you know, a learning disability or their education or their gender or um, it, the pandemic or whatever it is. And more than anything, I think you just have to figure it out. And that's the inspiration that I get from you, that you just go and you just do figure it out. And I think that you watch for the connection with the, with the consumer, uh, with the people that are following you. Um, all of that. So I really, really am inspired by everything that you're doing and keep it up and uh, do great things. And uh, everybody should definitely listen to Farah's uh, Mission Makers podcast too, because it's pretty great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate yeah. that. And definitely it's 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 about, you know, um, doing what fulfills you in the end, because you only have one shot, right? So you have to figure it out. It's hard. There's so many limits, whether it's a learning difficulty or, you know, friends, family, education, there's just so many. Um, but you have to learn how to adapt to that. And, and it, like this, we were talking on our, our podcast earlier that, you know, pandemic, nobody expected that. And um, we've all had to figure out how to thrive in, in a situation like that. So, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's really the, the, like, as you say, you have to, you have to figure it out. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for listening and thanks again, Farah, for coming on. And uh, definitely, uh, if you have not listened to the Kara Golden podcast uh, before, we're here every Monday and Wednesday with incredible founders and CEOs and leaders who are living undaunted and are figuring stuff out along the way. And please subscribe and give us five stars uh, for this episode on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify or your favorite platform. And you can also follow me on all social platforms at Kara Golden with an I. And finally, don't forget to purchase my book or uh, download it on Audible. It's available worldwide as well uh, for people to learn a little bit more about my journey of building a company, which is today the largest privately held non-alcoholic beverage in the U.S. We are not in outside of the U.S. yet. Hopefully that will happen soon. And uh, definitely pick up a case of uh, your favorite water if you are in North America and really appreciate all of you listening and joining us and definitely DM me if you have any questions or just want to say hi. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of the week.